class, welcome to uh, chapter 10 in Cultural Anthropology at Kirkwood. And chapter 10 deals with marriage and the family, and these are some of the topics we'll look at. Um, the book, of course, will start off with the with its own, the author's definition of marriage. And um, according to our textbook, marriage is a socially approved sexual and economic union, usually between a man and a woman. So the things to focus on here is one, socially approved. So it's something that the rest of the group recognizes and approves. And the other part of this is sexual and economic union. So we assume it's a sexual union and, and most, more importantly to culture anthropologists usually, I guess it depends on what you study, but um, is it's an economic union. Um, so you assume that there's um, the economy from the, the bride and the groom, usually again the male and the female, but we'll get into some exceptions there and um, you could probably assume some already. So um, cult or marriage we find as a cultural universal. So remember we talked about universals as being those things that we find in nearly all cultures. However, there are a couple exceptions that the book points out. And we see uh, one in China and one in India. And the book talks about that this may be due to um, um, uh, the male-female ratio, um, more females to males. Um, also, the book talks about um, the traveling of males, so the males are gone. Um, basically, the book ties it in kind of to an absence of males as one explanation as to why these certain um, societies may not have marriage. And then, um, as I just hinted to, one uh, another exception to this part, usually between a man and a woman, is same-sex marriages, um, which we um, uh, recognize here in uh, the U.S. and is just um, becoming more and more recognized and accepted, although still controversial. And um, as you remember from the gender chapter, um, some, some cultures have more than one gender, um, and so we would typically think of those as same-sex marriage, but, um, but again, that because they um, differentiate gender, uh, might be a little more complex than that in some societies. Um, so when we have these universals, we think about why. I mean, is this something that's innate in uh, humans? That's the first kind of suggestion that I would think. So if it's something that all cultures do, it seems like it'd be something that's kind of more um, nature than nurture. Um, so one, so the book gives several theories that have been put out there as to why marriage is um, universal in, um, are nearly uh, found in all societies. So. One is, as we've discussed before, gender division of labor. So if uh, females are doing certain things, males are doing certain things, it makes sense through that economic union to combine those two things. So that would be one theory. Another is that of all the primates, humans have the longest prolonged infant dependency. So that just means that infants depend on their mothers and fathers, in this case, um, through the theory to um, take care of them up for, for an extended period of time. And so the thought here is that, you know, because of that, it makes more sense for um, a union between males and females to, and, and especially in terms of Darwin's ideas, you know, that um, successful reproduction, um, that sort of thing. Another theory out there is the sexual competition theory. And again, this is kind of tied into to Darwin's ideas, but so um, human females are theoretically can have sex any time of the year. Um, and so because of that, they, um, there could be continuous competition among males um, to, and this is also another kind of theory that you would think about comparing to other um, animals and how the sexual competition involved there. So all of these theories have their strengths and weaknesses, which you can get from the textbook. Um, finally, we can look at other mammals and birds, and um, those, um, when we do that, the main thing to, to pick up here is that those um, other animals and birds that have um, females who cannot provide for themselves and their babies at the same time, 
typically have stable mating partners or um, marriage, you know, although this is, um, you know, we're talking about animals here, um, so that the male of the species can help the female take care of um, the offspring. And again, that just leads to sec successful reproduction. So this, uh, this book chapter has a lot of interesting um, examples of ways that one um, marries. So, uh, of course, it's a cultural universal, but it has a huge variation in terms of, you know, how does one marry? How does one mark the onset of marriage? Um, you know, um, sexual relations within marriage, those sorts of things. So there's all sorts of varieties in terms of that. So some societies mark marriages by elaborate rites and celebrations, while others do so much in much more informal ways. But again, it's a socially approved uh, union. So there has to be something that marks that onset so that the rest of the group knows, hey, these people are now married. So in our culture, you usually have a wedding ceremony. And um, um, the, the specific part, of course, is the signing of the marriage certificate and, and that sort of thing uh, to make it a legally bound marriage. But, um, but then you present yourself as, as husband and wife. So um, there's variation, again, in marking the onset of marriage and the economic aspects of marriage. The book gives some examples of um, from the Inuit and the, and the Trobriand Islanders. Um, so you'll want to read those. Those are uh, pretty interesting examples. So in terms of the economic aspects of marriage, um, um, again, in our culture, there's, you know, we get married, there's people bring gifts, that sort of thing, and it's definitely an economic union. Um, but in non-commercial, non-Western societies, um, that we, have, we see more of these types of uh, economic exchanges that occur um, before, during, after um, the onset of marriage. So one is um, bride price, where typically the groom's family um, offers up um, an amount for the bride um, or there's bride service where the groom will do some sort of work for the bride's family. Um, there's exchange of females so um, you know you're um, so that the <clears throat> a sister from one family might go to this family and then their sister might go to this family that sort of thing. Um, gift exchange between families, so if they're going, they're interested in marriage and they start to send gifts back and forth. Um, dowry, you've probably heard of before, this is kind of uh, more of a um, uh, Renaissance, medieval um, Europe kind of thing um, where, um, and it's typically, you know, there's no, the, the family that's giving the dowry doesn't get anything back, so it usually has to be a wealthy family. Um, that is um, where this occurs, this dowry of um, gifts given to um, the, the bride in terms of the married couple. Indirect would be where you'd give to the parents first and then they would give to the bride or couple. So you can see the breakdown here of how often this occurs. And again, these are usually in um, non-Western, non-commercial society. So bride price is the most common. Um, bride service, the next most common, and then indirect dowry, dowry, oh no, uh, indirect dowry, gift exchange, dowry, and then exchange of females is relatively uncommon. So some restrictions on marriage, this is another universal, is the incest taboo, um, and, it, and I think to us it just makes sense, um, but, um, but again, there, um, usually you cannot marry um, close kin. And again, with any kind of universal, there's um, there's different theories as to why that is. Um, you know, to us, it, it makes sense, and this, this and we usually go just based on the inbreeding theory, and in that if you marry and have um, children with close relatives, there's um, genetic aspects that are involved there, genetic um, deform deformation, and that sort of thing. Um, so, other theories are the childhood familiarity theory. So, basically. Um, I don't know about you, but if you have siblings, they can push your buttons pretty easily. So um, usually if you grow up um, with someone, you, you know, you, as soon as you can get away from them <laughs> and let only see them so often, the better it is. So that's one theory. Freud's psychoanalytic theory. Um, you probably heard of the Oedipus complex and the electric complex before, um, you know, where um, the Oedipus complex where the male um, has a love or a sexual um, lust for the mother. 
and feels competition from the father, so um, represses that. And then the, the electric complex is the opposite. And then the book points out weaknesses to these again too. So that this one doesn't explain um, sibling incest and why that's not um, why that's taboo. So the family disruption theory is, if you remember Malinowski, um, and he was he was uh, uh, he focused on functional aspects of culture. And so basically, if the males in the family were trying to get after the females in terms of siblings, that would disrupt the family. And so that's another theory as to why the incest taboo is there. Cooperation theory um, is between families within a society. If they marry outside of the family, it causes more cooperation and adaptive customs between people within the culture to help the culture survive. And then I kind of touched on this one already, the inbreeding theory. Um, usually this is accepted in Western, um, more modern, I don't know if modern is the right word, but Western society um, with scientific thinking on um, genetic aspects involved. So here is um, a picture from the book that shows these, these children are not siblings, but they grew up, they grow up together. And um, this is just uh, another example of the childhood familiarity theory in that they could, <clears throat> they wouldn't be violating an in, the inbreeding theory because they're not physically related. But um, through childhood familiarity, they, these children um, usually do not marry when they get older because they're familiar with one another growing up. So then again, there's variation on whom one should marry. Um, you probably heard of arranged marriage, marriages before. Um, we obviously don't have that um, here in the United States. Um, but it's where the, the parents of the bride and the groom um, get the two children together. And it's usually for an economic union or um, social status kind of thing. Um, exogamy and endogamy. So exogamy is marrying outside of a certain um, kin group and endogamy is marrying inside a certain kin group. Um, cousin marriages, these are these are more for um, non-commercial, non-Western society. So we'll get into kinship here soon. Um, and so um, these non-Western societies um, have different ways of looking at who is related to them than we do and it's much more complex to us. Um, but the book talks about parallel cousins and cross cousins. So cross cousins would be, sometimes it's okay to marry cross cousins, but it's not okay to marry parallel cousins and vice versa. And you can look in the book to get the definitions of what those two are. Uh, the leverite and sorate is, um, uh, again, has to do with marrying brothers and uh, sisters and, and that sort of thing. So um, we think of marriage as involving just one man and one woman at a time, but some societies, you probably heard, allow um, a man to be married to more than one woman at a time, and we call these polygamous um, groups. So polygyny is where a man can marry more than one woman at a time, and polandry is where a woman can marry uh, more than one man, man at a time, excuse me, and this is less common. Um, so polygically, as I just said, polygyny is a practice in which men are allowed to marry to be married to more than one woman at, at the same time. Um, one theory is that the societies that have a long postpartum sex taboo allow this practice. And so what that means is after the woman has a baby, um, she cannot engage in sex for a certain amount of usually, typically years. Um, and it usually has to do with breastfeeding and spacing of children and, and that sort of thing. And so in those sorts of societies, um, polygyny is more common. So sorrel polygyny um, involves marrying um, sisters, um, so they, in other words, the more than one wives are related to one another, um, and then non-sorrel is where they're, the, the multiple wives are not related to one another. So polandry, again, is less common. It's where a woman is allowed to be married to more than one man, and fraternal polandry is brothers, so she marries multiple brothers, and non-fraternal polandry is um, where the men aren't related to one another, and usually in both cases, there's usually economic reasons for this. So that was kind of the, the marriage part of it. The, the, this chapter also talks about families. And so again, we need a definition. Family is defined as a social and economic unit consisting minimally of one or more parents and their children. And so um, in our cult culture, we typically see a nuclear family with a um, man, woman, children. 
Um, again, they, some of these things are changing um, in our culture as well, where we might, with same-sex marriage, might be male-male um, children, female-female children, and adoption is um, the case here. And, and a lot of adoption is different and um, seen differently in a lot of different societies, um, as you can imagine. Um, so, in Native America, particularly in Native American um, cultures, a lot of them have um, different views of adoption, where they will adopt a child from. Um, another family, but doesn't. But it's not the same kind of idea where they come in to the family um, and live with them. It's just more of a um, kind of like a, what we would consider a godparent kind of thing. So we see lots of variation in, in family form, um, particularly in the terms of extended family households. Um, so again, we have a, what we call a nuclear family, where you have a married couple and their children, um, and typically independent families where a family lives alone. But um, there's also extended extended families, which we see um, more in um, non-Western, non-commercial societies, particularly sedentary um, agricultural societies or horticultural. So prevailing form of family consisting of a married couple and one or more uh, married children all living in the same house or household. Um, so in extended families, the newlyweds are assimilated into an existing family unit, um, which is more likely to perpetuate itself as a social unit. So here is kind of our first look at a kinship diagram, which we'll be getting into here shortly and is um, necessary to go through in a cultural anthropology class, um, something that definitely is associated with cultural anthropology. So a kinship diagram, um, the triangles are males, the circles are females, the equal sign equals a means a marriage, and the, these going down mean this is their children, so this is the father, the wife, they married, they had a son and a daughter, this son married here, um, that sort of thing. So you can use this legend to kind of see, get first familiar with a kinship diagram. So some possible reasons for extended family households, I already kind of um, hinted at this, but uh, they're mostly found in societies with sedentary agricultural economies. So sedentary means they're staying in one place, um, so it allows the extended family to stay there and all kind of cooperate as a social unit. So um, um, it also prevents economically ruinous division of family property. So you know, it can all stay within the family. And it's found where either parent must be away from the household to work. So again, it's kind of like, um, might think of it as like a, a babysitter type thing or help to raise the children in a generational kind of um, aspect. So a quick run through there of chapter 10. And I can't get these videos too long because otherwise, um, you know, they don't upload very well. And plus, you know, you don't want to hear me talk for half an hour. So <laughs> with that being said, I will be quiet um, and I'll see you on chapter 11.